Well, I think one of the main things that uh, Hiroshima and the atomic bomb mean in terms of, for the world is a warning of the dangers that are possible. Of course, it also means the, the tragedy of what happened to people here is very, very real. But part of the reason that it remains such a strong and powerful symbol in, uh, in the world to most people is because it's a symbol of what sort of war we might expect and what, sort of, what the future might hold for humanity. Really? Uh, there, there was a, a curve for a while of war moving away from being fought between combatants to being fought against civilians. And uh, in many ways, the fire bombings in Japan and then finally the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the final step in which war was really brought to a point where it was total war against, uh, against cities and against civilians. And now this is the way that uh, at least during the Cold War, global war was planned as obliterating whole societies, entire countries, uh, entire populations, uh, as opposed to fighting against an army or fighting against a government. And so uh, it, it was a harbinger of perhaps the, uh, the fact that nobody is, nobody is safe and removed from war. Nobody is, non, is, nobody is, uh, is considered... Uh, uh, Nobody is considered um, to be non-expendable. In order to defeat your enemy, it's perfectly acceptable to kill every person in that country, every child in that country, and to make that country unlivable for human beings. And uh, that takes war to a different level. It removes the idea of war being between governments uh, and between armies. Um, and of course, there's still been a lot of wars fought that are not fought on that level, that are still fought uh, you know, on a smaller scale, but uh, but it made it acceptable to it made it completely acceptable to kill civilians and to target urban areas in war. Um, there's, it's complicated the ways that it's affected the Japanese people. On the one hand, uh, it was used fairly quickly to position by the Japanese government to position the Japanese people as victims in World War II rather than as aggressors in World War II. Uh, so it became convenient to forget the war crimes committed by the Japanese in China and in other parts of Asia and to position the Japanese as people who were victimized. Uh, so that's the, the political national level and that still continues to some extent today. But, uh, but here in Hiroshima and for a lot of people in Japan, one of the things that it did was it gave them a sense of being, uh, of being messengers to the world about peace and about the dangers of nuclear weapons specifically. And people in this town very seriously take their responsibility to educate the rest of the world about what happened here and to educate the world about nuclear weapons and about the dangers of nuclear weapons and proliferation globally. Um, so it's had a really lasting effect and of course you know, Japan has largely been a country that has avoided any kind of entanglements in foreign conflict since then. Um, and so, in some ways, the power of what happened here really instilled in the Japanese a sense of the damages of war and the dangers of war. Um, so it's, it's uh, had a very, very powerful, long-lasting effect. Uh, certainly, as I'm sure you've seen in this town, the word peace is on everything. Um, and part of that is a little bit crass commercial, but, uh, but it's really true that people here think about peace and talk about peace all of the time. And uh, while that's true probably for all victims of war, and for all victims of uh, really traumatic events, uh, Japanese people and especially the Hibakusha community have taken it upon themselves to try to reach out throughout the world to anybody who will listen to them to try to seek the abolition of nuclear weapons. Really? I agree. It's, there, there is a sense among many people that change only comes with great tragedy. Uh, that right now, for example... Um, oh, it's okay. That right now, for example, uh, people really have put nuclear weapons out of their mind, except for, in my country, in America, except for the possibility of terrorism. But they really don't think about the United States is a nuclear weapon holding country and there's a sense that it will take another of these weapons detonating for the people of the world to suddenly realize the urgency with which we need to eliminate these weapons. Um, it's wonderful when we can make uh, when we can make change without being forced into it by circumstances but 
very often it is circumstances that create change. Well, they've never had any logic. These are weapons that, that in essence are really unusable um, because the scale of destruction and the scale of toxicity is so immense that they're really not functional weapons in warfare. Um, and so I don't think really that the logic has been about uh, the functionality of these weapons. To me, I think from the start, the reason that nuclear weapons built to such high stockpiles in the United States, certainly and probably in the Soviet Union as well, is because of money. Uh, nuclear weapons are a very big business in the United States. And after the Cold War, uh, the, the reason there was no move to eliminate nuclear weapons was because, well, people have always wanted to eliminate nuclear weapons, but the government has lots of contracts. A lot of people make a lot of money off it. So they looked in my country, in the U.S., for a new enemy, which was terrorism, because they were trying to rebuild the sense of an endless war against an enemy that can't really be defeated, because that's a basis with which to use all of the tax money that's drawn from the public for weaponry and for profiteering on weaponry. And, uh, and until these weapons are attacked on that basis, I think it's going to be very hard to eliminate them. Because the reason that we have, I'm convinced the reason we have so many weapons is not because they're supposed to be used, but because they're supposed to be built and sold. So we can say that. I, I, I think it would be very difficult for Obama's government to change things because uh, when, when Obama calls for nuclear abolition, of course he's right. And of course it's hard to oppose it on the basis of, no, these weapons are actually useful. Um, but. We've been right about nuclear weapons for 64 years, and that hasn't changed things. Uh, being morally right and, uh, and being correct, like Obama is, is not really the path. Obama is going to have to fight not people who argue that nuclear weapons are a good thing, but people who argue that nuclear weapons keep their economy alive, keep people employed, and that's a strong argument against him. So uh, he will have a very, very strong fight and resistance from the U.S. military and the U.S. military industrial complex, and not because of the usefulness of the weapons, but because of the people who are making money on these weapons. So that's why he needs to fight that piece, too. And he, he's, he's not really in a position to, but we need to force him, we need to lead him to fight against profiteering from building ridiculous weapons of mass destruction. Really? It, it's impossible, it's an illusion to talk about democracy from the perspective of America when you have hundreds and hundreds of bases in 140 countries or 120 countries, I forget the exact number. I mean, that's a, that's a massive empire. And it may be a different kind of empire than earlier empires, but uh, it makes the notion of democracy that America tries to sell quite ridiculous. America uses the word democracy to mean uh, access to controlling economies and markets. Uh, they're really not interested in democracy. Uh, but it can be fought and it will pass, much like the earlier empires passed, which at the time certainly seemed all-powerful and difficult to dislodge. But the American empire will pass too, whether it will be replaced by yet another large power establishing military bases and dominance around the world is a good question. You know, what we need to fight for is for each country to be able to... Uh, but there, there needs to be an ethic created whereby the stationing of troops from other countries in, in different countries is, you know, is seen as a warlike act and is seen as anti-democratic and imperial. Um, but it's, uh, it, the United States does not use the word democracy to really mean local people make their choices about how to run their own governments. Uh, it's, it's a form of soft empire. Really? It's indicative of all, uh, the dynamic of the Cold War in the sense that uh, for the United States and for the Soviet Union, everything that happened globally was interpreted through the framework of the Cold War conflict. Uh, you know, historians speak of Cold War dualism. So every country was either seen as being in one camp or the other, either in the Soviet camp or in the U.S. camp. Uh, what you had in Vietnam was a classic anti-colonial movement of the people of a nation trying to take control of their nation after a long history of colonialism. But for the United States, it was impossible to see the Vietnam War. Uh, it was impossible to see Vietnam for what it was, which was people taking control of their country back from colonial powers. They could only interpret it as a country moving closer to the Soviet Union rather than to the United States. And so uh, the purposes of the United States in getting involved in the war in Vietnam to stop the spread of communism were really not uh, had nothing to do with what was going on in Vietnam. 
And so uh, it, was a, it was a pointless war. Uh, it did not accomplish our goal, which was to keep the world from moving closer to communism. Uh, and uh, in essence, a lot of people died trying to repress uh, an anti-colonial movement, which in the end succeeded. Oh, the, the drawing of the borders by the colonial countries is uh, is uh, a tragic, uh, a tragic, brutal act that continues to reap havoc and death all around the world. Uh, when you look in the Middle East at how the drawing of the borders has ended, has created all kinds of conflict and has disenfranchised people. For example, the Kurdish people who were left without, who were left divided in several countries. So they are continually at war against, uh, against the uh, dominant governments uh, in several different countries as opposed to simply being able to control their own destiny. Uh, also in Southeast Asia, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. It, it just shows the kind of pomposity and the kind of lack of, uh, of nuance and lack of humanity that the colonial powers had, that what they left in their wake was lines that were drawn that were bound to lead to conflict again and again and again. And I think that in all of those conflicts, you have to lay responsibility for those deaths, partly at the feet of the colonial powers that drew those lines. And the really? Well, I think that one of the things I would say and that I would advise is that it's very easy for all of us to be stirred up into conflict against our neighbors by, being, by seeing them as ethnically different, as religiously different, as, uh, as nationally different, and that what we need to realize is that war is almost always conducted to reinforce the control and status of a ruling class. And whenever we find ourselves being told that such and such a group is a danger to our nation, or that such and such a religion is out to get us, we need to realize we're being manipulated by people who are seeking to use us to reinforce their own power and their own status. And we need to realize that all people all around the world are our brothers and sisters, and that our goal is to live in peace and harmony with them. And to we need to be able to see through the lies that are told us, that divide us with other people, uh, and instead, see the manipulation that we're receiving from our own nations, from our own power elite, and from our own governments, and we need to realize that that is really what's causing the danger, not the people of another ethnicity or the people of another religion.